just say it's a great pleasure for me uh, you, for, to, to welcome uh, Peter. He's not only one of Canada's most recognized uh, and read uh, uh, authors, because there's lots of authors around, but they're not all read quite as much as you are, Peter. But <laughs> Gust and Disgust. Gust and Disgust. Uh, and I won't go through the number of books he's written, but he's familiar to most of you as a very well-known author. Maybe perhaps what you didn't know, and we'll learn as we go through this evening, was that he was in, he started his career when he, he came to this country, uh, I don't say as a refugee, but certainly in the middle of the war, or just the beginning of the war, as somebody uh, leaving uh, a scene of action as a young person and that experience formed him and he returned and performed a great deal of service to our country through his service in the Navy and uh, he uh, has written of course uh, a book uh, on naval matters and we'll come back to that but Peter I just wanted to uh, say uh, I, uh, I too was in the UNTD I was in the, it was called the University Naval Training Division. Peter started in that. Uh, I was in the UNTD and rose to the magnificent rank of sub-lieutenant, at which point I retired. So. Peter, however, rose to be a captain. So there you are. Some people stay and perform, and some of us are too busy young lawyers and are not able to do that. But it was a great experience. And Peter, maybe, I know you've advocated that we should go back to having more like a UNTD or CRTC or a way of having engaging young people in the country, but would you care to make a few comments about your experience in that way and how you think we might look at that for the future of the country? Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask, uh, to thank you all for asking me to be here. Um, it's a welcome opportunity. It's great to see Sonia. Uh, and I, you know, people ask me what the Navy needs, and I say a dozen Sonyas. <laughs> um, I, uh, I want to go back just before the UNTD because the reason I joined the Navy was quite interesting. Uh, as Bill said, I came here uh, as a refugee. I didn't speak a word of English. Um, I didn't. We didn't know anybody in the country, and uh, my biggest wish nightly, daily, was to become a Canadian. But I didn't know how you can do that. I mean, you, I, you know, I learned the language, I went to school, I went to university and all that stuff, but nobody knew whether I was a Canadian. And finally, in my teenage brain, it, it came as a, as a vision, because I saw some service people, um, I think they were actually Air Force people, but they had a Canada badge, and everybody knew they were Canadian, and that's why I joined the Navy. So I <laughs> was an identification. Yes, yes. And as it happens, uh, I was in the last group uh, inducted into the UNTD as an ordinary seaman. Uh, in those days, uh, we had uh, white cap tallies mm -hmm. and a square rig, and I. Um, you know, uh, literally weeks after joining, I was aboard the, uh, an Algerine, which no longer exists, uh, called the Portage, and it was a ship, a naval ship, uh, actually a minesweeper, and we went to Bermuda um, on a training mission, and on the way back we hit a hurricane, and that was, uh, you know, this is a 900-ton ship, I mean, this is not a big vessel, and uh, we well, I didn't know if we were going to make it. You know, we go straight up and then straight down uh, when you're not on a heavy ship. And uh, I remember my, my, my main memory of that was that from the bridge, I couldn't see the front of the ship. There was some walls of water coming at you. Um, and that was quite an experience. Um, then I was on the uh, Iroquois and many others. Um, but. I'm going to come out of the closet uh, tonight, and please don't get nervous. Uh, uh, the closet I'm talking about is a kind of a, uh, what, conspiracy? Too strong a word. But I got to know uh, during my service uh, many or most of the admirals and the flag officers of each coast. And what they were looking for uh, is a journalist with credentials and a large circulation 
who would carry their, their story. And their story was one of frustration. Now we're talking about sort of the 30 years, 40 years after 1947, um, which were very, very painful. Um, Pierre Tudor happened to be a, a friend of mine before he went into politics. And after, uh, I asked him once when he was prime minister, where the Navy ranks in his list of priorities. And he was ready for my question because he knew I was in the Navy. And he said, oh, number 14, just after hog, su hog subsidies. <laughs> and uh, this was not just Navy, this was defense. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, right. And I mean, you know, that's, uh, well, yeah. that was his attitude. Um, and so my, I don't want to make too much of this, but the fact is that the admirals blessed me for doing this, and what I did was to uh, expose all of the, not all, but most of the terrible things that were happening <coughs> in the Navy, because, not because of the Navy's fault, but because they weren't given the funds to run a proper Navy. And I'm going to give you some examples, but before I do, I want to tell you uh, quite an amusing story about the day I brought the Third Fleet into Pearl Harbor. Um, it, it, it's true. Um, I was, um, there was a flag officer of Pacific Coast called uh, Admiral George, Bob George, a wonderful guy, and he uh, asked me to fly to Pearl Harbor and talk to the Admiral in charge to uh, promote more common training between the Canadian Navy and the American Navy on the Pacific. Uh, which I thought was a great idea. So I, I flew there and had a meeting with the Admiral, who, like most Americans, uh, was wonderful. Uh, first, you know, individually, Americans are always wonderful. Collectively, so they sometimes scare the hell out of me, but this, this Admiral was particularly um, amenable to, to my suggestion. And uh, at the end of the meeting, he, he said, um, uh, and I was a reserve commander by then, and I, he said, well, is there anything we can do for you? And I said, well, look, I've never been to Pearl Harbor. It probably won't be again, so I'd like to get a tour of the harbor. And uh, so he called in Flag Lieutenant to give the commander here a tour of the harbor, and he said, we can't, sir, because the tour boat is being repaired. So the Admiral grandly said, believe it or not, take my barge. Now, as you all know, an Admiral's barge is a very special vintage uh, boat uh, that uh, is a holy uh, object in, in any harbor that where it is, and everybody gets out of the way, everybody <laughs> salutes. Uh, so next morning, I'm out in the Admiral's barge, we go to the Arizona, which is, you know, still there with about 2,000 uh, sailors uh, in, entombed, and then we go to the Utah, and we do all these things that are very moving, and then the coxswain, who's in charge of the Admiral's barge, says, well, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, let's go out to the ocean because Pearl Harbor is quite a bit inland. So it's a summer afternoon and we're sort of lazily going out toward the ocean and suddenly the coxswain freezes and he looks up and I look up and my God, there are these bunch of skyscrapers coming towards us. They turn out to be uh, the third fleet coming off maneuvers, uh, you know, missile cruisers, uh, aircraft carriers, huge, huge things. And this little Admiral's barge. Uh, and of course, they see the Admiral's barge. They don't know who's on it. They just see the Admiral's barge. And uh, they go crazy, you know, flags flying, and uh, <laughs> lining up on the starboard side, and uh, everybody saluting. And the coxswain looks at me, and I look at the coxswain, and we both shrug, you know, because what's the rule? Well, if you're saluted, you have to salute back. And so that's what we did. I got this on the saluting platform and saluted. <laughs> and, uh, that, that's not quite the story. It, it, it is true so far. <laughs> but uh, the fact is I didn't bring the third fleet in because eventually they, or quite quickly, they realized what was happening and the thing stopped. But, but I did bring, uh, well, I don't know, about half a dozen uh, ships in and it was, uh, and everybody was very upset except the Admiral who, who thought it was wonderful and laughed. And, so, that's my story. <laughs> Did you ever know Admiral Buck? Did you ever know Admiral Buck? Was yes. he after you? Yes. He was recently. He was vice chief when I, yeah. when oh, I was there. People. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. They're, and, and Commodore Budge. Did you ever remember Commodore Budge? He'd oh, come up from the ranks, remember? Yes. 
and, and he used to address his cadets and tell us, listen, you kids, you never swab decks like we used to have to swab oh, decks. No. I did a lot of painting. I learned how to paint in the Navy. I don't know what you learned. The old school, though, I remember very well. You know, we, we, we had some good officers and oh, some wonderful good officers. officers. Wonderful officers. Um, now, I'm going to start um, to, to reveal some of the things that the admirals and I decided we could reveal and trying to mobilize public opinion to give the Navy more money. Now that was, no, that was never written down, but that was my agenda. Uh, at one point, for example, there were three destroyers uh, still on the books of NATO as, as our, part of our commitment to NATO that were tied up at docks uh, to be can cannibalized for spare parts for, to keep the other destroyers uh, still going. That's how short of money we were. And uh, this is true, it was, uh, you know, it's one of the things I published. Another one was, uh, one of these uh, ships that was uh, tied up at a dock was a very famous ship, HMCS um, Crusader, which had saw action in Korea. And uh, it was, it's, its bottom was so rusty and it's, it's watertight doors, you could walk right through them. I mean, they, they, that's the condition these, ships that were still part of our NATO agreement were in. Um, there was, uh, of course, the Protector, is still, which is still around, I believe. It was um, our contribution to the first Gulf War. And um, somebody noticed that, uh, yes, it was painted gray, um, and it looked like a warship, but it didn't have any guns. Um, so they put a three-inch gun on it, not to shoot anybody, but so they could get a get ahead in the lineups at the diesel dogs. Um, you know, this is the typical of the kind of thing that went on. Um, I trained on an absolutely awful vessel called Port Saint Jean, which was one of the gate <laughs> vessels. These were used to open and close the gates uh, in wartime in the Halifax Harbor. And it had the distinction of being condemned as unseaworthy on, her, on its maiden voyage. <laughs> uh, how can I say it? it? It was so bad that its commanding officer um, finally went to a Canadian tire store and bought two Javex bottles that he painted gray and hung them from the uh, mast. And they looked like, um, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, the things you use to uh, to train your guns, you know, the, the electronic things, uh, um, but they were traffic problems. Um, uh, imitation radar, sort of a radar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gun direction. And he also had a asbestos pipe, which was asbestos because you didn't have to pay the grade, it was gray already, uh, sticking out at an angle that a gun might stick out. You know, and we, we did all these things because we thought, well, if we're going to be a Navy, we have to look like a Navy. And uh, it, it sounds pretty desperate and pretty, uh, um, uh, well, we weren't making fun. I mean, we were trying to send a message. Um, for what, what year was this, Peter? Uh, well, this would be from the 30 years after 47. It, it never got better. You know, in, in, in the, the 70s, basically. In, yes, in the 70s, uh, early 80s. But the, the worst insult of all, I thought, was the fact that the West Edmonton Mall had spent $800,000 each for three submarines that were far better than, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the 1960 era uh, or, uh, models that we had. Um, and uh, there was a fuss in 1994 Two uh, crew members of the Oberon uh, class submarines um, actually water skied behind the uh, behind the vessel while it was on the surface, um, towed by the uh, sonar tow cable, and uh, hanging on. Um, they were not disciplined, and my theory was that they were not disciplined because they finally found a use for the submarines. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, you know, we all know about the uh, seeking helicopters, but actually one of them set a record during my time. 
uh, and the record was, and you know, these seekings, uh, I think they were in the uh, air for 30 minutes after 30 days of repairs. It was ridiculous. There's a lot but, of repairs. I've flown in CKs. So. Yes? Well, I was still using it all. It took three weeks to reach Halifax from Vancouver. This, it, the seeking took three weeks to fly to two cities. Had to come down for repairs so many times. Um, there's a Polish merchant ship that um, put in at Resolute Bay, as ships were supposed to do in those days, to report they were going into, it quotes, the Northwest Passage. And uh, that was fine, except uh, the Naval Air Patrols uh, were out for three days. You could never find it. And the theory was that it was still up there. But, uh, you know, it, it, again, it shows how little we had uh, in the North. And I'm uh, glad to see some of that being fixed. Um, I was out on a destroyer on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and um, I was on the bridge. And uh, I could see these little orange lights. And I kept looking at them. And I finally realized what they were. They were vacuum tubes. You remember the old radios? The, uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was a, that navigation equipment on the destroyer was run by vacuum tubes. So I asked the navigation officer, well, but who makes vacuum tubes? No, nobody makes that. He said, oh yes, there's a, there's a factory in Poland. But, but there was the height of the Cold War, and they were dependent on vacuum tubes. Uh, <laughs> I had better navigation equipment on my sailboat. Uh, so, you know, those are things that happened. Um, finally, uh, when the Athabascan was uh, sent to uh, be part of the uh, Canadian contingent in the first Gulf War, uh, they had no anti-aircraft weapons, so they had to take the Beaufort guns out of the Halifax Maritime Museum and put them on the... And, you know, on and on and on it goes. And by publishing stories like that, I believe I contributed to um, you know, some real uh, equipment being available and budgets right. moving. Well, can I ask a question about that? Because yeah. you were at the conference which we had, and you were good enough to speak to Admiral Garden after he spoke. Yes. And uh, again, hearing from the Admiral there, uh, one, one got that sense that our military has always gone through these various periods of you know being properly financed, and then it goes into a sloth, and then it's an monopoly. And I got the impression from what we learned at the conference that while the Navy today uh, is looking forward to new ships, and uh, there's a bright future sort of well over the horizon, that they're facing in many ways not quite the drastic problems you're talking about. But but, but there's a lot of problems between now and then about actually keeping them properly equipped uh, and afloat, and uh, it would and be... Pro and properly manned. And properly manned. So, I mean, you've written about the need to be more in the Pacific, more in the Arctic. Uh, have you given some reflection about the extent to which, you know, your experiences sort of can be projected in a way that would help a better understanding of our needs today? Well, you know, I, I, I believe the Navy, <coughs> uh, as opposed to the other two services, of course, are not going to uh, is much more uh, useful in e on economic terms. You know, for example, we should never think of ourselves as being uh, on the west coast of Canada. No, we're on the east coast of the Pacific. Uh, and if you make that switch in attitude, you suddenly realize, yes, that's what we are. We're on the east coast of the Pacific Ocean. Right? And our outlook should be uh, into that ocean, and into the countries, and into the Asian economy. Um, and just by making that little, uh, you know, change, mm -hmm. uh, and don't think of uh, BC as being on the west coast of Canada, it's on the east coast of the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a small thing, but I think uh, that's the kind of, uh, you need that kind of thing to, to change our attitude and to become part of the Pacific, as, as Mr. Harper is trying to do, and I've given him good marks for that. Yeah, well, I think that came out at the conference, that there yes. was sort of a his remark recently that we are a maritime nation is something that our prime ministers have not focused on to that extent. And, not at all. And, but do you think with the Pacific Rim, I mean with the new 
Pacific Gateway, the whole thrust there that we will eventually, that we are seeing a, a consciousness in Canada towards that I, I specific don't nature of our country and, and that the, the military investments and others will follow from that? We have no choice. Um, you know, the American market is, uh, is, a, is a very uh, self-centered market. Uh, they're discovering more and more oil. I just spent uh, a week in uh, the tar sands, the oil sands. I'm going back. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredible place. Just to give you two statistics about, I was sitting in the airport at Fort McMurray, and uh, I had remarked that it was kind of a small airport for all the things that were going on. <coughs> the answer was, well, do you know how many airports we have? I thought it was the only airport. And the answer was 19. There are 19 airports. Now, some of them are small uh, landing strips that the companies have beside their operations, but there are there are half a dozen major airports. Um, and it's the has the highest traffic in Canada now by far, including a direct flight from here to Fort McMurray from well, uh, Pearson Airport. Um, second statistic, they, they can't keep up with the demand for housing. Uh, they just can't. So what they have is 60,000 workers uh, housed in barracks uh, around the uh, tailings, around the, the works. And they, they two weeks on, two weeks off, there's a huge armada of airplanes coming in and coming out with these workers. Um, now those are construction workers, those are not uh, the oil, they're just building more um, bitumen uh, operations. Um, but it is a world-changing uh, um, operation, and, and, I, and I believe it's, uh, it's going to grow much bigger. Uh, they're very proud now because I, I had a helicopter tour and I saw actually saw the the herd of buffalo that that are on the site. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that they, they show that that that, that they're re repairing and they, and they are. And I you know if, if you've seen uh, open pit mining uh, as I have uh, flying over Nevada, it, it's it's just as bad or just as good as uh, you know as the oil sand. Uh, I think they're overdoing the uh, harm of it. Um, but I take it from what you said that, that the logic, the logic, inevitable logic, is the export to the Pacific countries no rather than the United States. Yes. And uh, you know, and, and that's okay. I mean, you, 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 I, I once wrote that the Americans are our best friends, whether we like it or not, and uh, and that's true. But you know, they're not our only friends, and uh, friendship isn't uh, as important as it once was. Uh, countries go. Um, you know, where the need is, where the money is, and um, just as a footnote to all that, I wrote seven books on the Canadian establishment. It, it no longer exists. Um, we now have um, something that is much more exciting. Um, instead of an establishment, we, are now, we have now become a meritocracy. In other words, you earn your way into power it uh, doesn't matter what club you belong to, you marry, and you know, all the touchstones that once uh, determined uh, your rank are gone. It's what you've done this quarter, next quarter, um, and it's merit uh, that brings you forward. And that's great because it makes uh, the power structure much more accessible. And, and that's the direction of the future, and that includes uh, exports and, and everything we do. Um, I want to get this in because it's a wonderful quote. Um, I spent some time uh, in Portsmouth, which is the was then the home of the Royal Navy, and uh, ate there. And I realized the what they say about the British naval food that it's the world's worst food served on the world's most beautiful um, china, and and that's true. Um, but I remember reading uh, something about the history of the Royal Navy, and they, uh, well, we all know they would rule the world, but how they did it, you know, they would, there would be some uh, quarrelsome uh, sultan in uh, some continent, faraway continent, so they would send in one of the battleships, a 16-inch uh, moving uh, main 
guns and the um, 8,000 horsepower engines and you know and the, all the things that these incredible battle wagons had. And uh, one of them, uh, Sultan of Morocco, at the end of his tour, was asked, uh, you know, what, what impressed him most? I said, spending the day touring the, the battleship. And he said very quickly, quite obviously, uh, his conclusion, he said, what impressed him most? The captain's face. You know, and that determination was there. And that's, and that's what it was based on. Uh, you know, of course, there were exceptions, mm -hmm. but that kind of psychology kept the empire together. Um, one final note, um, and I feel very strongly about this. Um, my favorite admiral was Chuck Thomas, who some of you may remember. He resigned on a question of principle. And his favorite saying, which, which I want to leave with you because I think it's an important thing he said, allow us, and he was addressing everybody, but mainly the politicians in Ottawa, allow us to f fulfill our burning ambition to be significant in what we do. Allow us to fulfill our burning ambition to be significant in what we do. I think that's, that should be our theme, uh, and that should be the Navy's theme. Um, it should be the country's theme. Um, and, you know, I, I came out of the Navy um, having feeling that I was being part of a band of brothers um, proud of having served, even in a very minor way. Um, and you, you get to love the country through loving the Navy. And it's an experience that stays with you the rest of your life. Um, I, um, I wish we still had a UNTD because we created a, a band of brothers uh, who knew each other very difficult to get to know uh, kids your own age uh, now, and it's, it's very important, especially Quebec, you know, and then you, 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 you're isolated. It's a big country, it costs a lot of money to get around. UNTD provided trading and citizenship, <coughs> our thought was his main point. That was my experience. I mean, we, in our division, we had kids from all over Canada. And you see, we had four Quebecers in the in that division, and they never would have got to meet people from the Maritimes and from British Columbia and Alberta and everywhere else, and we all did that. And I think it was true probably of the Army, yep. CR2C, and the other yep. training. Yep. But you actually, Peter, you in your book, I think, rec recommended uh, a significant increase in the size of the reserves. Yes. Do you still believe, uh, do you still believe that's either possible or advisable in the present conditions? Or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you get so much more for your money. You get dedicated people. That, you know, fraction of the cost, um, and uh, and they are, and uh, you, you get uh, you get exposure. You know, I remember uh, being the PRM person for HMCS York when I joined them. Oh yes. And we got coverage for you know church parades because it made good pictures. You know, and that doesn't sound like much, but uh, the presence of the Navy. Was very important and is very important because we're sort of tucked in the waterfront there and nobody sees us, nobody hears us. And, and one final example of the shortage of money, you know, the, the, the reserve divisions used to have uh, uh, used uh, fair miles as uh, mm -hmm. boats, ships, I don't know. Yeah. Um, which, uh, but anyway, um, once uh, this uh, fair mile we had had to be repaired and uh, under the rules, you had to take it to Halifax to have it repaired. So nobody had provided a budget to get it there. Um, and we had no, uh, no government money. So we, the young officers, pooled our credit cards and we went down the uh, seaway on, on our private credit cards to get the boat up there to be repaired. Yeah. You know, and that's, I mean, I hear you talking sure. about finances and I know the yeah. feeling. We got to show the flag. When I was minister, they wanted to close a couple of bases in downtown urban areas. And I said, how is a Canadian citizen going to know or have anything familiarity with the, the fact that we've got a military in this country that's defending them? If there's no presence, particularly, you know, below now with everything moved up here to uh, where it is, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's a real issue. We have to be, you have to be present. People have to recognize that as part of the council. But tell me one, one last sort of thing, and then I'll ask some 
I'll ask maybe, <coughs> I know some people here would like to ask you some questions, but just one little kind of funny thing in your career, because you've always been a strong Canadian nationalist, and, uh, but you also were a strong proponent of restoring the royal to the Royal Canadian Navy. Is this, oh, yeah. uh, is this, a, is this inconsistent uh, with Canadian nationalism, or is this uh, a part of the Peter Newman's youth coming out and saying, <laughs> I, I want to restore that sense of pride in the Navy that, uh, that came with that designation? Well, I, it goes back to my time at the, uh, with the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. Um, my host was uh, a Royal Naval Admiral, and he has a big stripe and three stripes. Oh. And I kept looking at this guy, and I said, one more stripe and he's king. Fleet anyway. And, uh, you know, they're just, uh, the empire was based on, on uh, grandeur and uh, adventure and risk and all the things that make the naval officers. Um, I don't excuse myself at all. Uh, I, I joined the Royal Canadian Navy, and I'm glad to be back in it. It doesn't mean that I you know, want to die for my queen, uh, because uh, as we all know, uh, in war you don't die uh, for your country, you die for your buddies. And, and that's been proven over and over again. Well, I think you I think you've lost us all with a very important message that the primary purpose of military is to deter war not to not to fight it and I think that's the greatest thing that uh, people have to recognize as Peter your career is good to all of us you've made a huge